Let's see, I don't know if we've ever taught on humility in this church. I think we'll teach on that tonight. No, not really. Finally, we're through with that. But we're going to come to the other second of two words that speak of our lowly state of mind and practice, and that's the word meekness. That's the word meekness. And by the time we get through with the message this evening, you'll see why we spent so much time on humility and will not need to spend but one message here on the subject of meekness. Oh, there are a couple of words. We've been away from words for a long time in ethics. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's difficult to get all those down and remember those. Well, it's impossible for you to remember all of them. That's not the point. There are a couple of words. Uh, maybe only two. I've got a third one that only appears one time. It's a late compound word. It only appears once. We may not even give you that. But we'll start with the significant words. Praus. P-R-A-U-S. Praus. It's an adjective that occurs four times. Praus, P-R-A-U-S, an adjective that occurs four times, has the meaning of something like gentle, mild, or pleasant, therefore meek. It's translated meek, gentle, plyle, mild, pleasant. Now, in some Greek concordances and lexicons, you may find this word only three times instead of four times. If you find it only three times, it's because what they've done is they've really given you another word. P-R-A-O-S, pros. They've given you this as being, it's a very, very similar word. It just depends on how it's spelled. They may give you Pros, P-R-A-O-S, as the fourth, or they'd give it to you really by itself. Let's say it only appears once over in First Peter, whereas Pros appears three times, all three in the Gospel of Matthew. So just for convenience sake, basically I've, I've lumped all these together. I'm not trying to make it a, a differentiation between Pros and Pros. I'm just putting all of them under, really underneath Pros because they're exactly the same word with exactly the same meaning. Okay, it appears Matthew 5, 5, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 5, and 1 Peter 3, 4. Unassuming, modest, unpretentious. So we have words that are very similar in meanings. We've looked at humility. We've looked at gentleness. We're going to find a lot of these can be very similar. Unassuming, modest, unpretentious. An adjective found four times. Then secondly, we have a noun found 11 times with precisely the same meaning as prous. Precisely the same meaning as this adjective, and it's proutes, just in the word with the T E F. P R A U T E S. Proutes. Obviously, you can see it's just built upon prouts. Prouse, an adjective four times. Proutes, a noun 11 times. And again, sometimes in some Greek concordances and in some Greek lexicons, you will find an 8-3 eight, eight, excuse me, breakup between this word right here, proutes, and a word that's going to be similar to this word, just like we found earlier, which looks like this. which is P-R-A-O-T-E-S. We 
this word being found eight times and this word being found three times. But again, where I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just telling you that's maybe what some people would find if anybody looks these things up on their own, which I doubt really anybody's doing it, or why would I need to look them up if you're going to look them up? But I'm just going to lump, lump all of this together, all of these these 11 references, instead of break it up, 8 and 11, 8 under praotes, uh, 3 under praotes, we'll just leave all of these together under praotes. Okay, here's where it's found. Notice that first word was a uh, word found a lot in Matthew, three out of four times, or somebody would say all the time, and then praos is found over in First Peter. Uh, this term... Uh, is not found in the Gospels, only found outside of the Gospels over in the Epistles. 1 Corinthians 4.21 for proud taste. 1 Corinthians 4.21 2 Corinthians 10.1 Galatians 5.23 Fruit of the Spirit passage, Fruit of the Spirit is proud taste. Galatians 5.23 Galatians 6.1 Ephesians 4.2, Colossians 3.12, 2 Timothy 2.25, Titus 3.2, James 1.21, and 3.13, and 1 Peter 3.15. Hopefully that's 11. That should be 11 for proud taste. Then there's one other word that's only found one time. It's a late compound word, compounded meekness with suffering but I don't think I'll even get into that because that doesn't that doesn't uh, that's not going to enter into what we're going to be looking at here okay meekness now we've taught on meekness before way back in Matthew 5 5 in the Sermon on the Mount so we've, we've taught the message is not unfamiliar to us of meekness uh, we'll just kind of be building upon that tape or how or tapes I don't remember how long we talked about meekness back in those days but we'll just kind of be building upon that so I'm going to kind of presuppose that knowledge so let's begin first of all with uh, a Greek look that is a, a look at the way the Greeks used this word and what they thought about uh, this word prontes meekness or what it means to be prouts what it means to be meek the Greeks used the word in its classical sense for a mild person for a mild person. Hence, one of the meanings could be gentle, mild, pleasant, or meek. Mild. They used it for a mild person. But they used it more in a neutral sense. What I mean by neutral is not moral or something that has bad morals, but something in between. Aristotle said that this word, proutes, meekness, said that this word meant the existence between being angry and not being angry. You know, you're not mad, but at the same time, you don't have a total absence of anger, but you're somewhere in between. That's what I mean by a neutral sense of mild. A neutral sense of mild. Aristotle said that it was the mean between being angry and not being angry. So I guess we could say it receives its its uh, its neutral its neutral sense because he's trying to balance it between two extremes. Now that, I guess that could be one way of thinking of the term. Well, obviously it was. That was the way they thought of the term. And that's probably maybe one way or maybe the chief way that some people would think of the term as kind of a balance. A, a meek person is not, um, they're not real bad, they're not real good, they're not, a, they're not an explosive individual as far as anger or self-assertion or self-expression. Uh, they're not a person who retaliates, but yet they're not a person who has all the composure in the world to be able to forgive, to forget, to be long-suffering, to pass over something, to be pleasant, to be mild, or something like that, but just mild in the neutral sense of you're not going to go to the left and you're not going to go to the right. Now, haven't we found that before in the Greek thinking? You, they won't commit themselves one way or the other. You won't commit yourself to something being positive or to something being negative here. It's something in between. 
So it lacks the positive thrust of the Holy Spirit. It lacks the positive thrust that it does receive with the inception of Christianity and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's not a negative word. It's a neutral word. Some of their words, remember, are actually negative in meaning, and Christianity takes over the term. We're just kind of doing a lay study in this area because we're trying to teach on ethics and not teach on in depth on uh, the uh, etymological basis for words like this, but it is very interesting to, to go into a lot of detail and see all the references, and you can look that up in some theological dictionary or some textbook on meekness or, or other of the virtues and see how drastic has been the change between the way the word was originally used, the meaning for which it was initially composed. Why do they need this word? It has to date to some time in history it has to have an origin sometime, somewhere, with some people in some place. And then to see how it has been so radically changed. With some of these terms, we've already found this to be true. To see how it has so radically changed from the way the Greeks would use that term. You know, they might have coined it, and the way they're using that, the idea behind that term, and the way that it's used in biblical writings, and then maybe in post-biblical writings, but it would be ecclesiastical post-biblical writings. Here's another case of that. It's just that we don't have the extremes of going from extremely negative to extremely positive. We have something going from neutral to being fully developed in the moral sense, in the spiritual sense, with the inception and the guiding influence of the message of Christianity. They really couldn't make up their minds, the Greeks, what was the opposite for meekness. If you could find the opposite of meekness, then you'd probably know what meekness was. Plutarch said that the opposite of meekness was severity. Plato said the opposite of meekness was cruelty. Other Greek writers said the opposite of meekness was anger. Those are probably the three chief words you'll find listed in Greek writings as opposites of this theme of meekness. Severity, cruelty, anger. You have to listen carefully here to see kind of what we're saying. I, I guess I can say it here in a moment. You'll see what I mean by this. They're taking meekness to be the opposite of these terms, these terms to be the opposite of meekness. Is that what you think? That the opposite of meekness is anger. The opposite of meekness is cruelty or severity. What, what in the New Testament sense, would be the opposite of meekness? I'm thinking of one term, but it's one big term. It's a compound term here, the opposite of meekness. Self-assertiveness is what the scriptures teach to be the opposite of meekness. Self-assertiveness. Not anger, not severity, not cruelty. The opposite of meekness would be, as one writer said, that which demands the ego be defended immediately on every occasion of its abuse. That's a description, then, of self-assertiveness, which is the opposite of meekness. I'll quote again. The opposite of meekness, or we could say self-assertiveness, would be that which demands the ego. Have you ever had your ego wounded by someone? <laughs> that which demands the ego be defended immediately on every occasion of its abuse. Now, now, what's the opposite of humility? Pride, arrogance. Okay, so you see we're talking about a difference between these two words then. Not so much seen in the word, not yet anyway. And even when we get to seeing what the difference is, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to make a differentiation between humility and meekness. But we see it via the opposites of these virtues. If the opposite of humility, the opposite of being a 
humble person is being a proud person, an arrogant person. Okay, is it also true the opposite of being a meek person is a proud person and, and an arrogant person? Not exactly. The opposite of that would be a self-assertive individual. Now, probably self-assertiveness will go along with pride, which will go along with arrogance. So that we've got all three of those concepts, pride, arrogance, which really are the same thing. We'll just say pride and self-assertiveness, which would be then the two opposites that, that fit correspondingly to meekness and to humility. So we kind of have to understand that to understand via the opposites of these words that we're talking about two different words that are just that, two different words, and not two words that are precisely equivalent or synonymous. That which demands the ego be defended immediately on every occasion of its abuse. The Old Testament... The technical Greek words are rarely found, but the concept certainly is there. Rarely found in the LXX, of course, which I shouldn't have to say. You would know that's what I meant. Technical Greek words are rarely found in the Greek translation of the Hebrew, but the concept is certainly there, and the Hebrew does have several words for the virtue of meekness. Let's go through a few references. We're not going to give the Hebrew. We generally don't in Christian ethics. Sometimes we have. I don't think we will hear those. Book of Psalms. 22nd chapter, 26th verse. We'll look at mostly at Psalms. The Greek terms aren't found, but the Hebrew terms are found because the Hebrew does have a concept of meekness. But it's not as developed as it is in Christianity. And I'll say more about that exactly why here in a moment. The reason behind that is also the reason behind the full development of any other virtue. Psalm 22:26. Now we're talking about meekness of spirit, so meekness in your deeds. So notice, notice uh, some of the statements that are made concerning the meek and their meekness. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him, and your heart shall live forever. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. Now, why would he be making a statement like that? Well, you'd think that the only ones who will ever eat to the point of satisfaction are the self-assertive individuals who make sure there's enough food to go around for them. Of course, he seems to be more talking about spiritual things here, but the application is still the same. The meek those who are not self-assertive, those who are non-self-assertive, shall eat and be satisfied. They will praise the Lord that seek him, and your heart shall live forever. In chapter 25, in verse 9, the non-self-assertive will he guide in judgment, and the non-self-assertive will he teach his way. I guess it would be, we're going to see a New Testament verse in James 1 that will set this forth. I guess we could say it'd be a little difficult to ever be taught the way of God if you're a self-assertive person. Of course, you'd want your own views, your own ideas to be asserted by yourself and therefore uh, plug up the channel, the flow of blessing, as it were, of God being able to instruct or to teach. Chapter 37 and verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth. Of course, we know Jesus quotes that over in Matthew. The meek shall inherit the earth, the non-self-assertive. It's always promising them a lot of things that you would, in the natural, think there'd be no way of obtaining apart from self-assertiveness and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And then way over at the end of the book, 147... And verse 6, the Lord lifteth up the non-self-assertive. And he casteth down those who are self-assertive, which he classifies here as wicked. He casts them down to the ground. So, of course, we're not saying that meekness and wickedness, the terms in themselves are opposites of one another. But it's interesting that since we know what meek means, non-self-assertive, 
Then he classifies those who are self-assertive as being wicked. And in chapter 149 and verse 4, the Lord taketh pleasure in his people, and he will beautify the meek with salvation. He will beautify the non-self-assertive with salvation. And then I have one other verse where a similar Hebrew term is found, and, and that's over in the little book of Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, and it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Now, the reason I'm reading this is because of what we said in one of those six or so teachings on humility. We talked about there was a twofold great biblical sense of humility and Christ's existence, one in his first advent in his humiliation, the incarnation, and another in his near his second advent, which will be the tribulation. We saw in Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 5 in Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 9 that one thing that will characterize the, the last days, the tribulation period, is that God will do what he'll humble all men, the great men, the mighty men, the captains, uh, the low men, the slaves, the bond slave, the servants, all of these. He will humble all men. Humility there. It's, it's the, in other words, it's the day of God's anger, the day of God's judgment, which is what the tribulation will, will be all about. Notice here we don't have the word humility. We have the same idea, the same theme here, because we have meekness. Seek righteousness and seek meekness. And it may be in the tribulation period ye shall be hid from the Lord's anger. That's what the day of the Lord's anger is, as we see from the earlier chapter, the preceding chapter, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Well, it goes all the way down to the end of that chapter, verse 18. And then, of course, Zephaniah didn't write in chapters. It's the same theme here in verse 2. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, we just saw that anger in the last five verses there in chapter 1. So it's certainly found. And what I said was that it was not as developed in the Old Testament. It wasn't developed at all in Greek thought. They just had the term in a neutral sense. The Old Testament, they have, Greek, they have Hebrew terms. Sometimes we have the Greek terms in the LXX, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. But definitely the Hebrews have the concept, the mentality of the theme, the virtue of meekness, what becomes a Christian virtue later in the New Testament not very developed why why is it not that developed well not only is it not developed but neither is humility neither is love neither is peace neither is joy let's give you a, a really really big one neither is forgiveness i mean that's in the old testament that's a theme in the old testament offer your sacrifices god will forgive you it's not as fully developed why 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 it's because all of these virtues, all of these virtues resided ultimately to the zenith point in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we had to await that time for them to be so fully developed. I mean, Moses was a meek man, was he not? Numbers 12, 3. But was he as meek as Jesus Christ? No. He was self-assertive on one occasion that cost him entrance into the promised land. Well, he was self-assertive on more than one occasion. He was a humble person. He was a meek person. He had to be proud one time in his life about something. Was Jesus ever proud or arrogant about anything? No. Did he ever, was he ever self-assertive? No. Was he ever self-assertive in the non-spiritual sense? No. Self-assertive is a manifestation of fallen humanity. And Jesus Christ, in not participating in fallen humanity, could never have participated in the unbiblical, unscriptural, unspiritual form of self-assertiveness. Peace. Who had peace in the Old Testament? David had some peace. Read it in his Psalms. David had some peace. Were there some times when he didn't have some peace? Who had more peace than anybody? Well, he said, he's got so much, he said, I give my peace unto you. But David didn't say, I give my peace. I wouldn't want David's peace. It's just the peace of another man. John 14 I give my peace unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you, but I give you my peace. I'm saying we had to wait until the incarnation, the manifestation of God in the flesh, 
in order to see these virtues developed to their highest capability and they've never been developed as highly as that since that time either not before never after only at that time it is true however that after he came and lived his life and we'll see verses we've already seen some that spoke of his humility such as in matthew chapter 11 verses 28 and 29 the same passage as we'll see later we'll also speak of jesus christ's meekness after he came manifested all of these virtues the fruit of the spirit is love 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 who who has loved above all love in the world jesus christ has loved has loved who has been long suffering above all beings jesus christ what other man let's say man say well the father in heaven well, let's say man that's walked on this earth that is that has had to put up with the struggles and trials and temptations that we human beings face here on the earth love joy peace long suffering a gentle person a meek person self-controlled how would you like to have his ability to control himself self-control he said in matthew chapter 12 when we read that in the earlier study here with the syriac bible the palestinian syriac bible that men shall give an account for every idle word that they speak i wonder if he ever spoke an idle word can you imagine can you imagine never speaking an idle word how many thousands of idle words have we spoken and look how much teaching he did he never spoke if he if he did speak one he's going to have to give an account for that in the day of judgment you see well that'd be blasphemy and heresy to say that or assume that he never spoke an idle word self-control he knew how to control himself self-control in every area he never overate overeating is an expression of a lack of self-control never did he do it not one single time oh he was hungry on occasion remember over there in john chapter 4 the one reason they're finally sitting down there at jacob's well is that he was weary we're told he was thirsty and he must have been hungry because we read there in john chapter 4 he sent the disciples into the local city to bring back some food meanwhile he has this conversation spiritual work with the woman at the well all about the living waters of salvation and by the time they get back they offer him the food and he said i've already eaten they said well which man brought you food you know good reasoning like we would think we don't see anything beyond the literal words that are said you know very very shallow perception of things who brought you food he said i have meat to eat of which he know nothing he said my meat is to do and finish the will of him that sent me overeating he was hungry he was thirsty he was tired that's the one reason that he sat down there and they bring him food they've been gone for a while he carries on this whole discourse with this woman before they come back he's hungry i mean to eat then would not be overeating he said i've already been satisfied my food is to do and to finish john 4 34 the will of him that sent me perfect control of himself perfect expression of every virtue that's why we have to wait all through the old testament era we have glimpses there of manifestations of meekness or humility or love or long suffering we have glimpses of manifestation through the holy men of god then forgiveness some that forgive others but maybe a little reluctant to forgive others and he certainly was never reluctant to forgive whenever he forgave he forgave whenever he forgave us he forgave us there was no reluctance on his behalf at all so we have to wait for his manifestation that's why it seems that that seems to be the key which is uh, a clearly seen key but that seems to be the key why in the old testament these virtues kind of pop in and out i mean it says seek meekness there in zephaniah but it's not like in the new testament where this is a fruit of the holy spirit this is a commandment of the christian look how big the old testament is in number of pages and extent of material look how small the new is look at all the times this term meekness is found all the times love is found <clears throat> in the new testament all the times forgiveness is found joy and peace in the new testament compared to this large corpus large body of material in the old testament why why there has to be some answer why it was the dawning of christianity he came to he came to express it in the way that he lived you could see in the way that he lived that he that he perfectly possessed 
what we now speak of as the fruit of the Holy Spirit are what we're calling here in this class as Christian virtues. Of course, they weren't Christian virtues to, to him. What were they? They're the very nature and character of God. That's why it's of, of the utmost importance that we possess and that we manifest these things. That's not Christian character to Jesus Christ. It is to us because it is supposed to distinguish us from people who are non-Christians. But what was it to him? The very expression of his being. We're told in 1 John 4, God is love. God is love. Not God has the Christian virtue of love. God is love. God is joy. God is peace. God is self-control. God is meekness. God is humility. And my point earlier in the humility teachings was look at the distance, look at the expanse between what we would think God would manifest or would have to manifest and what he would require of us. And what I mean by that is this. Since we are, are so sinful and corrupt in the first place, it ought to be easy to be humble and think so about ourselves because look of who you are. There's not much in you to think highly about. Look at God. He doesn't have the imperfections, the sins, the weaknesses, the shortcomings that we have, and yet he's humble. He's humble. I mean, it would be more difficult, my point is, for God to be humble because you would think of yourself, there's nothing in you but, per but perfectness, as it were. And look at us, what we have to offer, what we have to manifest. And we struggle and wrestle with these things. For the continuation of this... And look at us, what we have to offer, what we have to manifest. And we struggle and wrestle with these things. So it only makes sense to me that it's the dawning of Christianity in the ad first advent of Christ that we see a full development of these what we call Christian virtues. And, and then, of course, they're espoused in the writings of the apostles. Some misconceptions of meekness. Some people think meekness is poverty. Sometimes in the Old Testament, the meekness terms are even translated poor. P double O R. Or some people call it poor, which I thought was P O U R. But anyway, people have seen that and they'd say, now, that means that in order to be meek, one has to be financially poor, poverty. Well, that fails to take into consideration the context in which these passages are found where the Hebrew meekness terms are translated as poor. And what's the context? It's never in regard to money. It's always in regard to your spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. We finally have that verse, Matthew 5, 3, which should shoot a hole in the theory of people from a false reading of Old Testament passages that to be meek or to be humble is to be poor because in those Old Testament passages, sometimes it doesn't come right in, out and say in that context, poor in spirit. You can just tell that's what he's talking about. Spiritual poverty, that is a recognition of one's spiritual poverty, not financial, not monetary poverty we have to wait until matthew 5 3 where finally it actually is spelled out in so many words blessed are the poor in spirit and there's no way you can get poverty out of that it, but poverty of spirit not poverty as as we generally think of it so there's one misconception of what meekness is another misconception probably the most popular one and here's one that we'll spend a little more time on is is the little rhyming word weakness Meekness is not weakness. The popular thought, that means in most people's minds, causes them to make synonymous meekness with such things as timidity, 
There's a meek person. Effeminacy, pusillanimity, an apologetic nature and spirit, an apologetic character. Those are supposed to be more or less synonymous terms. If they're not synonymous, they fit in the same category. You can group them under some heading, and the heading would basically be weakness. That's what they express. And weakness, they're saying, is the same thing as meekness. Well, in cases like that, what we would have to say is that, therefore, meekness becomes a deficiency and not a virtue because these characteristics that I have just mentioned these are deficiencies. These are not virtues. These are not something praiseworthy. These are not something one should desire. Timidity, an apologetic spirit, an effeminate nature. There's no way that we could say meekness would be equal to on the same level as weakness because it'd be surrendering the good for the evil. It'd be surrendering what's a virtue for what we could say is a vice. Timidity, an effeminate spirit, an apologetic nature is certainly not a Christian virtue. But the deepest form of, of Christianity, the deepest form of Christianity, which is what we are trying to stress in these Christian ethics studies, is, is based on what the Greeks and what so many American people think of as the feminine virtues now you think about that that's the deepest form of Christianity it's based on what the Greeks and what most Americans think of as the feminine virtues compassion tenderness humility meekness gentleness you see all these terms were were feminine terms they were weak terms See, these very terms were weak terms. For instance, just to give you one, one example here, uh, some of the atheistic writers of the last century ha have, made following have made the following deduction. The reason that Christians forgive other people, see, forgiveness, one of the feminine virtues, the reason they forgive is because they are so naturally, bodily, physically, mentally, spiritually weak that they can't defend themselves and go clobber that person on the head. And that's why they forgive people. They say what Jesus came teaching was this, what were the feminine virtues, were all of the weakness character traits, the character traits of weakness, manifestations of weakness in, in human personality because only a weak person can really forgive someone, can really be gentle. We think of gentle, that's kind of a feminine characteristic, to be gentle, to be tender, tender-hearted. We've discussed that term before. That's not a masculine characteristic. That's, that couldn't be a biblical characteristic. Not if we think of the Bible as teaching anything strong. If we think of the Bible as teaching something weak, it fits right in there then because these are feminine virtues. And what they call feminine virtues most Americans, and certainly, most definitely, the Greeks thought of as manifestations, characteristics of extreme weakness in a person's life. They'd rather you be severe. They would rather you be cruel, as Plutarch and Plato had to say. They'd rather you be angry about something than be able just to pass over something, to cover something up, not recognize it or, or, not, or not let it bother you, they, they say, well, really, it's not, you know, you use that excuse to say that, that you're, you're so spiritual now, this doesn't bother you. Oh, no, it really bothers you, but you're so weak, you can't do anything about it. And because you can't do anything about it, that's why you're manifesting these so-called virtues that you have, which are nothing but weakness. And then they equate that with meekness. And I'm saying that the deepest form of Christianity is, is based on what the Greeks and what Americans and what maybe some of you used to think of as feminine virtues. Men don't cry, men don't show their emotions, men are not compassionate, men are not tender-hearted, men are not humble. Do you know of an 18-year-old whose car sits about, what, 36 inches off the ground, who is a humble or a meek person? No. <laughs> Blasphemer, arrogant, proud individual with his hot rod. The car is at such an angle, the back being higher than the front, you can't 
comprehend how the thing can even run anywhere. <laughs> well, you see, this person, obviously, he's a good American. He must have good virtues there. Does he have any feminine virtues? Obviously not. Obviously not. Is he a weak person? This is what I'm getting to. No, he would say. That's a strong person. And see, what I'm saying is just the contrary to that. We would classify a person like that as weak and not strong. Why? Why? Why classify a person like that as weak and not strong? Because it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier just to get in the flow of the river, the bandwagon of the way the rest of the world out there operates. It's a lot easier to do that than to rebel against that and go according to the, quote, weak virtues, end of quote, that the Bible teaches. It takes more strength and more power to be a forgiving person than to be a person who retaliates and refuses to forgive. So they, they, they put the blame back on us. We're kind of getting into a little philosophy of Christianity here. They put the blame back on us. The only reason you forgive people is you're too weak to go bash your head in. A strong person, he doesn't forgive anybody. He goes and deals with that situation. No, we're saying a weak one does that. He doesn't have any other choice but to go and throw his weight around or throw his fist around. He doesn't have the strength and the power that it takes not to retaliate, not to speak back, not to be non-compassionate, non-forgiving. He does not have the power that exists in those areas. The meek man really then is a strong man. He's a strong man. The meek man is not a weak man. The meek man is a strong man. These feminine virtues are the source of true strength in anybody's life. Only the Christian, though, can manifest them. You see, you can have, let's say, let me give you another example. I don't know if you're following my train of thought here. Amen. Let, let's have a, an 18-year-old young man who's newly converted and, and sopping wet weighs all of 100 and five pounds and so he and so the lord's really worked in his life and he wants to evangelize and so he's down at some local motorcycle club with these big burly barrel chested individuals with tattoos every place imaginable but on their ugly faces where they should be and <laughs> and he brings in this this message of christianity Oh, and what, what happens right away? This is a little weak little boy that's bringing in this message of his mama or his grandmama's religion. He's got mama's old-time religion is what he has. And those men in the eyes of the world are supposed to be the strong men. But guess what? Those men can't cope with their problems, though. They can't cope with their problems. Amen. The one who can cope is that 18-year-old who weighs 105 pounds. Why? Because he has a new power that resides on the inside of him. Therefore, Christianity just reverses everything the way we would normally think of them. It just reverses everything. We would think of a meek person as a weak person, and the reason that he's meek is because he's weak, and he can't do anything about situations where normally someone else could do something about it. Those fellows can throw their taunts and their curses and their slander around, and he can just bring forth the gentle, easy message of Christianity and he'll be classified in most people's minds as a weak individual. We're assuming that he has biblical meekness and biblical virtues in him. And one thing that he's not is weak. He might be meek, but he's not weak. And look where he goes. Why is it that, that these little so-called weak Christians will go into motorcycle gangs like that and get people converted, but that old hunky soul out there will never come into a church? Why? He's too weak. He's too weak. He won't come in on a church and sit in and listen to the service because he can't handle it. He cannot handle what he hears there. Who's the meek one then? When we look at things through the eyes of the New Testament, the meek one is the Christian young man, the weak one. They're not the same. Meekness and weakness are not the same thing. The weak one is the hairy, barrel-chested motorcycle gang member who cannot come in to a church and sit down and listen to the gospel uh, maybe because of many reasons one of those being he's afraid the gospel might win him over now look who's fearful look who's timid look who's weak look who is effeminate now and of course wait until some of these people do get converted 
And over that old scraggly beard with lice and maybe things as big as a rat living in there come all these tears of salvation <laughs> flowing over it. All of a sudden, look what happened to that weak person. He became strong whenever he was born again. Amen. That's what makes a difference is the born again experience. The whole thing is reversed then. What God has to do in the scriptures, and he certainly does do this, he has to, he has to protect or guard, as it were, meekness uh, from spinelessness. Weakness and spinelessness are more or less the same, but meekness is not in that category at all. God has to guard the feminine virtues. That's quote, end of quote. They're supposed to be Christian virtues for us. But feminine in the way Americans think of them. Forgiveness, tenderness, gentleness, warmth. Can you think of a man, do you generally speak of men as he's such a warm man? You think, oh, no, women are warm. What are men? Men are cold. Well, a Christian man shouldn't be. Women are tender. Men are not tender. What are they? They're hard. Well, see, the hardness, the coldness in that person, that's an expression of weakness. They're not strength. That's an expression of weakness there. Why? You're so weak, you won't let yourself let go and, and, and have some of these other strong virtues come to you like forgiveness and compassion and mercy and long-suffering and try to manifest these things in your life. Why? You're afraid. You're a weak person, not a meek person. Everything is reversed. Everything is reversed whenever we come over to Christianity and see how these things are done. Just the way we think of how we were at one time or how people are who are unsaved and who exist out there in the world. You know, at one time, you, you look at virtues like that, and you look at people like that, and you admire someone in that case. Such a strong person. Uh, or, we, or you could admire their coldness. You know, that, that man, that gangster, can just mow someone down, kill someone, and it doesn't even affect him at all. Is that because he's strong? No, it's because he's incredibly weak. You're a strong person. You couldn't do something like that. Only a weak person. You're weak. You just surrender. You just fall down and you kill someone. That's weakness. That's an expression of weakness, not an expression of strength at all. But God has to guard these feminine virtues, these Christian virtues from spinelessness. Not having a spine, having a yellow streak in its place. The meek man is the strong man. However, he exists without the typical heroic masculine virtues, which really are vices because many times they lead to sins of the flesh or sins of the mind, such as pride or the desire to show off in front of someone else. So I'll say that again. These feminine virtues are the source of true strength. But God has to guard them from spinelessness. See, Jesus was meek, but he was not spineless. He was humble. He was not spineless. He had no yellow streak to him. He took on the whole multitude of the religious leaders. He drove them all and their cattle and their ox and their dove and the money changers. He drove all of them out of the temple precincts. He had no yellow streak him in him at all whenever herod antipas threatened his life what did he say go tell that worthless soul go tell that insignificant base contemptible individual whenever he's brought it, it means his life to him in the passion narratives all he has to do is recant or not come forth and say i am messiah Pilate, are you messiah you said exactly what i am Herod questioning him doesn't answer him a word. Is he a weak man? No, he's not weak at all. What's the source of strength, we're saying? The source of strength is not being able to retaliate. It's not, it's not these manly, heroic characteristics of some people, it's those feminine virtues. That's where strength resides. You put two people, I mean, you've heard typical stories like this. You have two people driving in a car, one saved and one not saved. And someone dashes in front of you, typical woman, or a bad male driver, and causes you to careen off the road or something, and the Christian has composure. The other person is the one who screams and yells and swears and blasphemes God. 
who's strong and who's weak. Who is able to have composure, keep themselves composed in a situation like that? It's always interesting that it's the Christian, we're saying a Christian in the ideal sense, we'll say a Christian manifesting the fruit of the Spirit who is able to keep his composure in a situation like that. And the one next to him may be the world's strongest man. But the world's strongest man, that doesn't mean anything, though. You're basically a weak person. Uh, you go do that, but you're basically a weak person. Then I said the meek man is a strong man without the typical heroic masculine virtues, which are really vices. You know, the one who thumps on his chest like a baboon. The meek man is not the weak man. The meek man is the strong man without the typical heroic masculine virtues. Would you say, let me see how I can phrase this. Would you say in, in your understanding, just from reading the Gospels, your picture that you have of Jesus' earthly life, that he had the typical heroic masculine virtues? No. In the world's eyes, you'd say, we're talking about someone who's weak here, who went around teaching religion to old ladies and fishermen. I mean, he's a weak soul here. Strong man would have run for his local political officer. He would have run for emperor, at least run for tetrarch of something. That's what a strong man would have done. Weak man going around talking about heaven all the time. That's a weak soul. No, that's a strong one. But did he have the typical American, what we think of as American, the typical American masculine heroic virtue? Certainly not. Certainly not. Not at all. Does that make him weak? Not at all. It just makes him meek. These aren't really virtues. I said they're vices because many times the typical American masculine heroic vices, virtues, vices, lead to sins of the flesh and sins of the mind, such as pride. The baboons have various reasons, you see, for thumping on their chest. Yeah, it's part of their communication. Well, it's part of ours too we're communicating look at me i'm just like an ape <laughs> according to galatians 5:23, meekness is more than just a natural innate disposition it's more than that why it's a fruit of the holy spirit it is a heaven sent virtue Now, I've given you this example before because I've heard it before, and it's probably just uh, one of the best ones you can think of, and that concerns Moses, since, since we're told how meek he, he was. If you'll turn over to the book of Numbers, I guess that's probably where some people have come up with this notion about Moses. If you turn over to Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3, this is probably, probably one of the... One of the uh, best ways to express by an example a man's meekness and therefore this virtue of meekness. Now he's being criticized by his brother and sister Aaron and Miriam. It was initiated by his sister. We know that for several reasons. The most obvious of those being she's the one who gets leprosy in the end of the chapter. Numbers chapter 12 and not Aaron. And so we have verse 3 in light of that now the man moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth now the man moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth but do you picture moses as someone who was weak well fasting 40 days and 40 nights and climbing mount sinai about a dozen times over a short period of time is certainly not the expressions of a weak individual moreover if you'll look in exodus 32 verses 19 and 20 here's what this meek man did to the whole nation of israel see we're saying that meekness is not Spinelessness. Came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp and he saw the calf, the golden calf, that, that, that one that just 
climbed right out of the fire. Yeah. Only calf never formed by an artificer. And the dancing in Moses' anger waxed hot. Oh, he's angry. Well, he's still meek at the same time because they're not opposites. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel to drink it. <laughs> someone weak? Hardly. Hardly do we have someone weak here who can force... I mean, why didn't someone just go with their sword and lop Moses' head off right now? He doesn't have any guarantee of anything, but he controls the whole nation by the strength of his meekness. We see him later on, beginning with verse 25. He just he stands up there in verse 26 and says, Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. In other words, who's on my side? Moses is on one side and the whole nation's on the other side. He said, Who's on my side? I mean, what if, what if no one came to his side? <laughs> What would he have done then? Well, Levi comes to his side, sons of Levi. And he says, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother. A weak man? Hardly a weak man. And every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. There fell of the people that day 3,000 men. Because the word of Moses was more than that, it was the word of the Lord. So meekness, we're saying, is not weakness it's not spinelessness. It's worthy, rather, of the highest praise. It is a sign of the strongest men and an emblem of the strongest women. The weak man is the one who has to use his fists to retaliate. That's a weak man, not a meek man. Only the meek, only the meek man can practice non-resistance, can abstain from retaliating and exercise love and forgiveness. In Romans chapter 12, Paul teaches that the meek man leaves punishment to the will and to the hands of God. Because it is written, and he's quoting Deuteronomy, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Romans chapter 12. The meek man is a mild man as gentle as a lamb. The Didache makes meekness a mark to distinguish between tr true and false ministers. In an interesting passage in the Didache, it makes meekness to be a mark to distinguish between true and false ministers. And so does Paul in 2 Timothy 2.25. So I quote the Didache because the Didache is based on that verse anyway, 2 Timothy 2.25. Now in summing all of this up in light of the scripture references, all of those we gave you, we didn't turn to any, but the ones we gave you before for these different Greek words, here are a couple of points we'd have to say about meekness then. First of all, the New Testament teaches that all Christians, male and female, are to be meek toward all people. You might not have time to look these verses up with me as quickly as I can. If you can or don't, then just sit and listen. Titus 3, 2. Speak evil of no man. Do not be a brawler, but be gentle, Paul said, showing meekness unto all men. Titus 3, 2. Colossians 3, 12. This way we'll get our verses down then. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, humility, meekness, long-suffering. And you can make an asterisk that we have with that verse, humility and meekness in the same verse. Humbleness of mind is nothing but humility. Lowliness of mind is humility. Humility and meekness. Ephesians 4, 2. With all lowliness and meekness. And there's another verse with both of the words together, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Galatians 6, 1. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in meekness. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, 
Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We find it in Jesus' example, Matthew eleven twenty nine. We find it again in Matthew 21, 5. And 1 Peter 3, 4 has particular application to women. 1 Peter 3, 4. Let it be of the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. All Christians are to be meek toward all. Secondly, scriptures inform us that we are to teach, to instruct, to share, to minister, to testify, to evangelize in meekness. 2 Timothy 2.25, verse I gave you earlier, 2 Timothy 2.25, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God might grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth James 3.13 the wisdom that comes from above manifests itself in meekness 1 Peter 3.15 we gave you these verses earlier 1 Peter 3.15 he says be able to give an answer for that Hope that's in you with meekness to anyone who asks you. So we are to teach, to share, to instruct in meekness. Thirdly, we see it's a supernatural virtue. Galatians 5.23. And fourthly, James 1.21. We are to hear the word in meekness. James 121, wherefore receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. James 121. And then what's the relationship between humility and meekness? All types of things have been suggested to differentiate between these two. But I would say in the first place, bear in mind that although there must be some type of distinction between different words, many times they're used almost synonymously. Sometimes they're not. We just looked at a couple of cases, Colossians 3.12, Ephesians 4.2, and particularly Matthew 11.29, where the two words are used together. Therefore, the fault seems to be this, humility has reference to our lowly state of mind. And meekness is the outward expression of that. If we're going to make any distinction, I would make that distinction. I'll look with you at Matthew eleven twenty Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and I'm humble. Lowly in heart, I'm meek and I'm humble.